Jason mentioned, my name is Scott Schnars. I'm the Vice President of Sales for Cloudinary. Uh, I think most people know who Cloudinary is, but for those who don't, uh, Cloudinary has more than 8,000 customers. We have over a million developers, and we've quickly become the leading media experience platform for web developers and marketers alike in order to manage their images, their videos, other rich media assets, and to deliver an optimal end user experience. You can learn more about that by looking at cloudinary.com. And Casey, you want to give us a, a high level introduction, and then we can jump into some of these questions. Sure. Yeah. So I'm a senior director of uh, marketing at, on the Schlotsky's brand. So we're part of Focus Brands. So Focus Brands is divided into restaurant and then for specialty. So we have uh, Moe's, uh, uh, McAllister is obviously Schlotsky's. And then four on the, um, the specialty side are, are pretty iconic brands. So Cinnabon, Auntie Anne's, Jamba Juice, uh, and Carvel. Um, so just a bit about me. So I, I joined uh, this year. I came from AB InBev, where I was on the, the DTC side. So I worked in a global role. Um, before that, I've really been at restaurants for a while. So uh, ran marketing and, and global brand for Lepin Quotidian, LPQ in New York. Um, was with Blumen Brands for a little while. Started out restaurant side with Burger King um, in 2011, which was a hell of a ride. That's awesome. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> Um, before that, I mean, I started out life as an army officer. I uh, was a West Point graduate, uh, did a finance MBA kind of in between. So been around, seen a few different things, but I've really been in, in restaurant and uh, food and bed for a while. But it's amazing when you go down that list of brands, how many meals of just individuals that you've had influence over, which is, you know, to me, that's just really amazing. I mean, millions and millions of people. Yeah, I, I can't remember what the McDonald's number is. It's like 20 zillion or something. I mean, maybe, I'm, maybe I'll get my own uh, my own leaderboard up there. I love it. I love it. So, so you know, t tell us a little bit about your current role at Focus and more specifically at Schlossky's. What are you working on? Sure. So uh, I look after really brands. So media, products, um, field, it's kind of a little bit of everything. But we're also uh, a Cinnabon franchisee. So um, all of our 300 plus of our restaurants have Cinnabon as well. So it's an interesting challenge to have both. But really the, the Schlotsky's uh, side, I mean, I, you know, I used to go to Schlotsky's in high school and there was a time where the brand had gotten up to 800 some on units, it, it IPO'd. Um, and unfortunately contracted back down. So, you know, we're, it's a, it's an interesting role to be in because, you know, there's a huge presence nationally, but obviously not as many restaurants as we have. We're on a great plan to grow, to get really back to, you know, a few more hundred units in the next couple of years. Um, but really my role is kind of steward of the brand and, you know, leading the, the marketing team. Um, obviously we have, we have a CMO as well, Nicole, who's, who's amazing who just came over from Carvel, I'll give her a little plug. Um, and so really on my side, I, uh, a lot of it's on the media and things we're gonna talk about a little later, Scott. And you know, so you mentioned you joined about a year ago. What motivated you to, uh, to, to join Focus? What was the exciting opportunity for you there? Sure, so I kept an eye on Focus for a long time. Um, you know, working at Bloomin, my, my first, or my Boston International, Mike Kehoe had come over. Um, he's actually now at Subway, but the way restaurants work in F&B, especially everybody knows everybody, okay. you know, it's just kind of one of those communities, right? Um, but those are really iconic brands. They've been doing some really interesting things. Really, really enjoyed my time at ABI, um, but was living in New York in the middle of the city. We had our second kid in the middle of a pandemic. Um, living in 700 square feet in Manhattan was awesome. Um, <laughs> But having a baby with you in your <laughs> having that, bedroom, that, that that additional roommate is uh, that's a tough one. Yeah, neither of them pay rent, so that's <laughs> that's kind of a drag. Yeah, um, but no, I think a bit of it was kind of a lifestyle, but also wanted to get back into the restaurant side. Really enjoyed CPG. Really love what I do. You know, DTC was awesome, uh, but a role came up in here, and it was a unique challenge on a brand that I knew and, and really loved. But also being able to kind of like back at Bloom and be with a few other brands as well and, and learn. That's exciting. Now, uh, you have a, a really impressive background when it comes to digital transformation. And digital transformation is one of those things that if you ask 100 people, you're going to get 100 different answers of, of what DT actually is. Um, I'm, I'm curious, how do you, you know, first question is, how do you define it? Yeah, I think it's, it's really where the organization is. I mean, it was with orgs where you know, they had a website mm -hmm. and it looked like Amazon for the 90s, you know, and that, like, that was it. There was no data capture. There was nothing. And taking that organization from really kind of one to all the way to getting into pretty advanced data gathering, loyalty, e-com, all of these things. So it's it really, to me, it kind of depends on where you are. But 
just a transformation in general is just upping your game digitally and trying to be less list or less reliant on kind of offline analog. And again, it just depends on where the organization is, what your goals are. But you know what we've seen in the pandemic is DTC, especially and ecom, they are king. Um, yeah. It doesn't mean that you know drive throughs and in store and these other things are going to go away. That's the majority of a lot of our sales and restaurants still. But if you don't have that ecom loyalty component, um, it really now you're really behind the eight ball. So what, tell, tell us a little bit about what Focus is working on when it comes to digital transformation. And, and you know, I've, I've looked at the site, I've been to the stores, you guys are beyond the Amazon 1995 website. <laughs> um, where do you, you know, where would you stack yourself right now um, at Schlossky's and what is the goal to get to three or five years down the road with a full digital transformation process? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's, it's benchmarking against some of the really good ones out there. So, you know, the Chipotle's of the world, Starbucks, uh, Domino's. I mean, Domino's that are really interesting. It's been years ago now, but they really said that they're digital. You know, they're a tech company that yeah. delivers pizzas. So, yeah, so that that type of, okay, where are you in digital transformation? Who do you want to be? There's a lot of vendor things that are out there, but um, at least for Steffer, I mean, there was a lot of things at ABI that doing this globally was a, was a huge challenge, but deciding to build instead of just bringing in a vendor. So, you know, we had chosen VTAX, we built on top of that and essentially built like an, an OLO, you know, an, an e-commerce for all the customer bars and the ones that we owned. So here, obviously, you know, focus is way further down the road, um, but there are things I think everybody is focusing on of how do I make the guest experience less, you know, less friction, right? So how much can I integrate? What do I have to build versus what do I partner with? Um, but at the end of the day, it's about driving traffic and sales. And the UX and UI components, especially making sure that those are, those are about as easy for a guest to complete to cart as you can. So we're really focusing on what is the best for the consumer or for our guests. I think that's what, what everybody in, in F&B and restaurant do. Uh, but specifically, it is on that user experience. That's great. And I, I, I kind of gave you a three to five year horizon, but is digital transformation something that ever ends? Do you ever get to that point you know, three years from now and go no. like, oh man, we're done. We can kick our legs up or are we, you know, in three years, we're going to have to go through this you know, kind of iterative process again. Yeah, no, I mean, it's something that it's just, in, I mean, I'd say even just business in general, right? Yeah. Like quick and all that, but it's, it's a constant journey. Your digital transformation was funny. I mean, I've, you know, uh, very, really great colleagues who are very, very smart and better than me at this, but that was something at Outback, you know, almost 10 years ago, that was something on the digital roadmap was we were looking at this timeline or like, well, wait a minute, it's, this is never going to end. And it was this realization and kind of in the beginnings of this, of the digital world of, we just discovered X. Okay. Well, that came out of nowhere. It's just going to keep going on forever. So there's just, there's so much with convergences of technology and personalization and all these things happening that it's just, it's something that new tech comes out, things change. I mean, Google and Apple and Facebook basically canceling third-party cookies that threw everybody for a loop that kind of pushed up your digital transformation as far as first party and own goes. So you have to be extremely nimble, but also keep long-term what your business goals are. Yeah. And do you see the companies that you've worked for, do you see digital transformation being more of a uh, business efficiency uh, type of strategy or is it more of a competitive advantage type of strategy? I think it's both. Okay. Right? So it's, it's the font filling the funnel. Sure. I mean, that's always trying to, and, and more of the, I guess a brand flywheel these days, but how do I try, how do I talk to my guests and consumers, how they want to be spoken to where they are kind of fish yep. with a fish are. Um, and the old thinking of kind of the push mentality down um, of I'm you're going to hear my message on broadcast and these traditional channels, obviously, is, is really moved to a pull. So the consumers have a lot more power. They can have direct conversations with you one to one as a brand and really tell you things. But there's a lot in the digital space and you can't just shout at consumers anymore. You have to get a lot of real time feedback. See, data is really king. Um, but yeah, I, I just digital transformation, just digital in general is, it, it has to be a business goal of everyone because this is where consumers like to interact. I mean, yep. most people on their phones, that kind of thing. Um, but it is something that you can get a lot of efficiencies on, obviously. So, so the cost of e-com 
uh, in, I mean, not really with third-party delivery, but there's ways that you can get some efficiencies there, especially in labor and unit, unit yeah. economics. But I always caveat this with people want to have an experience still, and not everything is going to move to a phone, to a digital experience, especially on the restaurant side. And that's something we learned at ABI is that we had bars and restaurants when during the pandemic, we had really great e-com systems that our teams had built. But when bars reopened in Bogota, they wanted to go talk to a bartender. Mm, they didn't want to just sit on the phone and, and order something. So we had all of these wonderful tools, but it was such a welcome break for them to actually interact with another human that they, you know, there wasn't as lot of, as much adoption as we thought it, we thought there would be, you know. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so I want to ask you a question about uh, your your time at AB InBev. Um, before I do so, I want to use this as a reminder to ask questions in the chat. You've got the Q and A button at the bottom of the uh, at the bottom of your Zoom window. There, it's a great opportunity to ask uh, Casey any questions about his experience at Schlotsky Focus or AB InBev or during his career, kind of building digital transformation experiences for some of these big brands. Um, so during your time at, at AB InBev, I'm curious, how does marketing to these independent bars and restaurants that you work with differ from marketing to the company-owned stores at, at, at Focus? Sure. So we had a, a unique challenge because not a lot of people know this, but we have 600 bars and restaurants that ABI owns. So not in the U.S. Um, there are some, but because of the you know the, the tiered system and there's some things with you know prohibition laws. Um, outside of the U.S. is really where we played a lot with with direct to consumer. So um, had a complete vertical that was stood up. I think that got pushed into overdrive during the pandemic. So that the, you know the brand, the company did a really good job of seeing this come. So because we had bars and restaurants in China that we had to shut down in January, we, we knew this thing was coming. So we we're able to kind of build a big war chest. Yeah. Tell all of our tell all of our customers. You know, six million customer bars and restaurants as well. But because we had our own and we had a bunch of C stores and these other things we, in this vertical, we were able to stay pretty nimble. Um, but at the same time, it is a different challenge, right? So we would have a Budweiser bar, say in Shanghai, and we get a lot of data and insights that we'd be able to tell the brand of, hey, Budweiser or Goose Island in London, there's a, a perfect case study of that. You have an aspirational buyer persona or, or target of you know, 26 to 30 year old explorer and all these things, and that's who you want the brand to be. But I can tell you who actually comes into a Goose Island bar and it ain't that guy. So <laughs> at the same time, it was good because then the brand was just given more information. OK, OK, that's true. That's who's coming in. But are they coming in because aspirationally they love what we're doing as a brand with these targeted, the Explorer, our type and those things. Um, and so it was very similar. It, it, I guess it was kind of a twofold challenge of we have to drive sales and traffic to our own bars and restaurants, but get a lot of data to be able to inform the rest of the organization. And then also be able to share that with all of our customers as well. We didn't see ourselves as competing because if you put you know, a, a bar in Shanghai, um, there was elevation of our brands at all of our customer bars as well. So there really wasn't, it wasn't an, an antagonistic thing. Uh, but at the end of the day, it was really about how can we better serve our customer bars while we also learn more about our brands. Yeah. And, and who is the Goose Island kind of target customer now? Or who, who was actually showing up? Yeah, I mean, it was uh, I mean, really Scott was like guys like us, you know, right. kind of 40s, couple of kids. You wanted yeah. to come in and have a good craft beer in a cool place. Um, and maybe you got you were attracted in because of who Goose Island is trying to talk to. Yeah. Um, but the, that brand team is it locked down. They know exactly what they're doing. But it was more of, hey, here's another data point where, you know, maybe can it, it can inform the brand strategy. And how, how did the how did the brand react to that when when they started? You know, they went in with an assumption. This is going to be the 26 to 35 year old. I think you called it a traveler. Or explorer. explorer. It's kind of explorer right. archetype. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, how did the brand react and what were some of the things that you had to change when you learned about that? Yeah, I think you know, data is really king um, in a lot of CPG, obviously. So especially with, with DTC verticals and it wasn't just us, it was, you know, our competitors and Coke and everybody else trying to learn more about their, about the end user. So it's funny, I mean, we would go from, we sold the most Fosters in the world, right? At Outback, oh, wow. you know, yeah. So the ABM brand. So yeah reps would come in, hey, you're still buying hectoliters of beer, that's great, keep it up. And we had all of this data and insights on who is actually coming in and consuming the beer. So it was interesting, you know, ABI really did solve that and say, we should have our own and we should be a very data-oriented organization. So 
it was really good in the 3G capital side. Uh, that That is something that's definitely a, a good pillar of theirs is if you have data and you have evidence, that's going to win. Um, yeah. And so it's good to change your perspective and not be married to things because the landscape changes constantly. What about, um, let's shift gears a little bit, talk about uh, first party versus third party technologies. What are some of the third party technologies that you're using to accomplish your DT strategy at Focus today? Sure. So, I mean, we have, we have some really great vendors, um, you know, they're like the Yex of the world that we use for, yeah. uh, for some things on, on location management. I mean, a lot, a lot of the stuff's public that's out there. Um, but, you know, it's more of do we, what do we take on in-house for strategy um, as opposed to what we build and that sort of thing. So some of them, I'll just say just in general, not just the focus thing, that is always your first step is how much of a, do you want to rely on a vendor's essentially sprint plan and path for agile, knowing that, Hey, I've got these things that I need, but is it going to go into your plan as far as what yeah. most of your customers need? Right. Um, and it's choosing good vendors and partners that will customize and do things for you. So quick example is, you know, with our, our current loyalty uh, partner was things like tracking for attribution. And they were able to step in and say, Hey, we'll add this to the platform. We'll do these things because, you know, obviously we made a case because we needed it, but also everybody does too. Um, but we've got a really great array of, of, uh, of partners, but also we do a lot in-house and we do a lot of lifting here. Oh, you do? Okay. So it's, it is a bit of a, of a build versus buy type of culture there. Yeah, I think it just depends. We, we try to be agile minded like, like everybody yeah. else, but it is, it really just kind of depends on the capability. So we have some really talented digital people in here and architects and, and other things, but you know, that is just in general, the rub between do you bring in engineers and compete with the Googles and those guys sure. that are all fighting for talent? You know, ABI would very similar challenge of how much can we build because of, you know, who's out there and who we can actually bring in house. Um, and then who you who do you rely on your partner for? And do you, do you find, um, oh, there's so many things to unpack there. Do you find that when you're evaluating technology, do you lean more heavily on What's the roadmap and your confidence for them to deliver? Or do you look at you know, what is their level of flexibility to work with us and to uh, support us for some of the things that we're asking for that may be unique to the, uh, to the market? Yeah, I, th I mean, I hate to say it, but it's both. Yeah, right? sure. So I think it's us identifying as an organization, first of all, like who we are, what do we want to take on? So, you know, um, LPQ, we did a massive digital transformation and there were certain things that we wanted to take on and things that we just knew we could. So contracted with, you know, an agency and had them design and build certain things. So we were doing like a Smart. pay above solution with MasterCard, right? So not going to build that ourselves. Yeah. But there were things that we did want to build in-house and take on. So websites and, and that, that sort of thing that they're a little bit easier. But I think it comes down to resources, right? And so what you're trying to do, um, there's certain things within food and beverage just never we're never going to build our own POS. You're just not going to do it. So point of sale system. Um, if you do, I think like Starbucks has an entire floor of engineers. That's amazing. Uh, but again, it comes down to like the, what is the cost benefit of us buying or using a partner versus doing this ourselves? And a lot of the, at least in my career, what it's broken down to is the, the user experience and the UI stuff in the front and what the consumer sees is what we tend to focus on in the brand versus the back end building, engineering, all of that, trying to outsource that to a vendor generally. Yeah. What about uh, video? Are you doing anything with the uh, video at Chlotsky's today? Yeah. So we, we rely pretty heavily on video for in-store experience. So we have digital menu boards in, in a lot of the restaurants. Okay. And that left side's always the feature panel. And at least with food and bev, right? I mean, video sells. So I mean, still, you have to see a, a product image, um, and that tends to be on a, on a menu what will sell. It's got to be part of the brand standard, right? So if you're fine dining, you're probably not going to put up a bunch of <laughs> images of your food. <laughs> but if you're QSR like us or even casual dining, um, yeah. it's amazing. If you, sh if you show a still even, that product will move exponentially faster than something that's just the menu description. So taking that into video is even better. You can really show that sizzle. You know, Chipotle does an awesome job with their banners, right? Of this is, we're going to introduce this product on, you know, the homepage, even just the website and a video experience is just so much more, you know, interesting to, yeah. to your eye. So we try to take on the same thing in restaurant um, and wherever we can, we try to use video. 
Well, I've noticed with so many of the QR menus that are floating around now, a lot of restaurants are starting to take advantage of that video experience just directly from the menu. And it's, you know, it does create a, a cool or more interesting customer experience. What, yeah, what for about- sure. I mean, it's, it's so visual, right? Like in a restaurant, you, you just, there is some, like, I can tell you that something is tuna niçoise that's pole caught in France. And, but if you show any type of an image that shows that will sell or, or just entice much better than anything I can yeah. write. Exactly. What about personalization? Can you talk a little bit about what you're working on from a personalization standpoint? Um, yeah, I think. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, let's, 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 let's no, talk about that. I think that's, that, it. Sure. I think that that's the big challenge for brands is personalization, right? And so how do you get to a point where it is personalized? It's based on my data. I opted in. I've given you all these things in loyalty. I really do want something that is personalized for me. And when does it get creepy? of how did you know that I wanted these things? Wait a minute. Um, so we're trying to, I, I'd say we lean a lot in, in just loyalty and gathering that data, the first party data side to understand, hey, you Scott love the original and you always get it with a Cinnabon. And you know maybe those are the things that when I start talking to you, especially with imagery, those are the things that are gonna pop up. But personalization in general is a challenge because it is based on, you know, we're a brick and mortar location, right? And we're a brick and right. mortar store and yeah, we're, We've, we've e-com like everybody else, um, but what's going to entice you to actually come in and order as opposed to, I just want you to come in and just buy whatever you'd like. Yeah. That's amazing. So um, another opportunity, if you have questions, ask them in the, uh, the, the chat. I, my next question is going to be around the future. Like when you think about futuristic technologies like AR and VR, is that something that you're starting to play around with? And, and if so, how? And if not, are you starting to see anybody who is playing around with that? And, and what are they doing that's, uh, that's interesting to you? Yeah, I, we've we played around with some AR, especially on social. I think social is kind of like the safe place to, to play around with it. We have some, some in-house content producers done some really cool stuff. Um, a lot of it too with store design, um, okay. especially VR, AR. So we're working on, we're actually, we're rolling out a thousand square foot and 1800 square foot prototypes for Schlotzky's. So those are, you know, classic two, two drive-through lanes. One side will be just pickup only. So deliver, you know, digital orders, first party, third party, and the other side's more of a traditional drive-through. But I think eventually we'd all like to get to, you put on a VR headset and you could show a franchise candidate, this is what your store is going to look like. That would be an absolutely incredible thing to do. With AR, it's a little bit easier because you, you can just use filters and that kind of thing. Right. Um, as far as the guest experience, I think nobody's really figured that out. If it's an, if, if it's an immersive exper experiential thing, like you got a Harry Potter store right on in Flatiron in New York, and there is a VR experience there, you would expect that. Sure. But within a restaurant, you know, that I think that there are some challenges and things, but as far as development and franchise sales and some of these other, the ways that we can actually show what a concept will look like for sure. That's a really great idea. That's, that's really smart. Um, I, I got one more question before we jump into the, the Q and a and, and Ryan, I think we have what about 10 minutes left. Yeah, we've got you. Uh, we've got you slated for another 12, 13 minutes on my okay. end. Perfect. So, so it just like pops in and out. Right. <laughs> Whoa, I, it's, we're not alone in the green void. It's like the Wizard of Oz just kind of popping up from out behind the curtain there. Um, you know, so when you think about, um, you know, maybe, maybe you can impart some wisdom on the, the audience here in, in terms of a, a valuable lesson that you've learned over the last uh, maybe year or a couple of years in, in your career that would be helpful and what would be a, a key takeaway for them? Yeah, I, uh, with the pandemic, I think it's the old Mike Tyson quote, right? Of like, everybody's got a plan yeah. to get punched in the face, sure. Um, but the biggest thing I would say is really the focus on DTC and consumer, really what is best for my guests? What is best for me? And I think as marketers, we always try to think that way, but evangelizing within, within the building, the same of, yeah, I know that this, like you talked about before, Scott, of, this is a business objective, but is this what is best for our guest? Because that's ultimately who should win. And we'll find other ways around it. But I think just on the, just in general, man, people are a lot tougher than you think they are, right? I think the COVID taught us all of that. I never expected to be walking down Lexington Avenue at 11 o'clock at night 
you know, walking my wife to give birth, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, yeah, it was wow. crazy. But also, you know, being able to work from home, do it very quickly, be very nimble and agile. Um, but I'd say the biggest thing that I've really, I think I could push just on the leadership side is be honest with your people, be upfront, be empathetic, all of those things. But you really have to level with people and be in it with them. So, you know, my team at LPQ, we went through a really rough patch. We worked our asses off on a, on a brand that ultimately, you know, filed for bankruptcy. And I know Becky's on the line now, but being able to bring in talent that are incredible like she is, and then be able to tell them where things are going to be okay. And I'll tell you if they're not, and just yeah. being honest and upfront. You, you said, you, the, you know, the, one of the first things you said is like, you, you should do what's best for the consumer. How do you decide what's best? Like who makes that ultimate decision? Um, if there's some disagreement about, you know, we think this is going to be best and another group thinks that the other way is going to be best you know, at, at focus. How do you weigh what is actually best in your mind? Sure. I mean, we try to be data driven and okay. you know, we, we use uh, consumer insights research. We just ask people. So it was a perfect example of some, some of our things with menus or should we take this off? Should we put this on? Let's ask the guest because I may like it from a PMIX standpoint, product mix. The operations VP may, may hate it or love it based on you know, operations. But if we talk to the guests and they say, if you take this off the menu or you add this and we will love you or hate you, that's ultimately who should win. So I think we all, I mean, look, we have to make money. It's a business. Um, we can't give everything to everybody. It's, you know, business, as I always say, is a, an exercise in scarcity. But the first layer has got to be what guest responses are in research. That's great. I mean, just be data driven, which is something we've all been learning over the last decade or so. It's awesome. Um, we've got a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Yeah. From the, uh, from the yeah. audience. Um, the first one is from Becky Miller, and, and Becky asked, uh, I'm curious about how the franchise relationship works with Cinnabon, given both brands are in the same brand portfolio. Yeah, great question. So we are sister brands, um, but these are actual franchise contracts that were signed. So, you know, we have actual franchisees of Cinnabon. So we are treated like any other Cinnabon or any other Cinnabon franchisee, I would say. Um, we have a, obviously a unique relationship because we're here, um, but you know, the Cinnabon team does an amazing job from the brand side. So we, we really try to divide it up as a franchisee, franchisor would of, you know, help us drive traffic and sales, you know, the brand, that sort of thing, um, even though it's within a Schlotzky's. But we're also doing some other things with, you know, there's a Jamba um, Auntie Anne's concept that's, a, that's a, um, together that's out, that's in Texas. So we're trying to find pretty innovative ways of do we do franchise agreements? Do we not? Do we, you know, how do we get our brands together and, and work better um, and try to just find economies of scale and, and all those good ways of working? But at the end of the day, you know, I'm a franchisee. So it's interesting to be on this side of the table for the first time ever. Oh, I bet. I bet. This, the second question is from Mitzi Portwood. And Mitzi asked, what's your point of view on the role uh, LTOs are driving for driving new traffic or frequency versus driving revenue via core menu? Yeah, and that's a great question. I think LTOs are all about driving new news and keeping brand relevancy. So, you know, food and beverage, there's a lot, there's not much loyalty, especially on the QSR side. So people will go based on, hey, there's this new thing I want to try. Um, the thing for me is, you know, that's great. Get your brand message out. Does it have media hooks? Does it have PR hooks? Can it sustain? The challenge is, does it stay on the menu? So that's the second part of your question that's about, when does, you know, is this better to focus on core? Kind of depends on your strategy, at least I think. But if you, the perfect LTO is one that sells so well that it either becomes like your shamrock shake and every March, you know, it's coming or just becomes a, a part of the core menu itself. So I think that that's where the finance part of it comes in with PMEX, where did we shift? Was there cannibalizations, that kind of thing. And then making the determination as a brand. So everybody checks in ops, marketing, finance, um, is this something that should stay on? I think we always talk about a core message. That's just the, you know, your core menu, that, that's your brand, that's who you are, you need to talk about it. But peppering in new news, um, I think it's, it's depends again on, you know, working we'd have something like 12 LTOs a year, but we also had a huge budget. We had a lot of things that we could talk about. And so budget tends to dictate how much you can really scream. Uh, I personally believe in fewer, bigger, better, uh, making things more impactful. Is that the best media strategy? Because you know you have to spread out your media dollars over a longer period. 
But answer the question, I think LTOs and core menu have to work together based on the brand strategy, but really one is about new news, getting kind of media out there, and the other is about maintaining your, your current guest. One of the follow-up questions that Mitzi asked is how is Schlotzky keeping things fresh for the guests? So maybe you can kind of expand on that a little bit more. Yeah. So um, it's, oh, this whole year, really, that was kind of the, the brand relaunch is that we went back to bigger portions of protein, bigger portions of meat. Uh, and that was, you know, it's a mouthful as our campaign. So uh, you could get a sandwich that's as big as your head at Schlotzky's. Um, and that was something that was part of the original brand. Um, and so that was something just going back to that core was, was very exciting for us because it was finding what was, what does our guests really want from us? And then how do we expand out from there? So um, the other part is pizza. I think we're the only brand that you can, one of the only brands that you can get a pizza through a drive-thru. Um, and so that's something that has been a, an awesome impact for us. Uh, something that, you know, the innovation side we're able to build on top of, but we try to keep things kind of fresh and updated and fun with our, you know, bakery credibility because we you know, bake everything, all the bread in-house, it comes from scratch. There is a baker in every Slotsky's that sits and actually does it by hand. Um, and so how do we take those core things and then make them more fun? Uh, and then adding, adding in really our campaign and branding through the year. The other side too is just the, like we talked about the digital transformation and technology side. So how do we talk to our guests the way that they want to be talked to, make it frictionless as easy as possible. So that's a big thing for us is on the loyalty and first party side. That's good stuff. Um, Allison asked a question, what's your take on visual branding that, that uh, didn't occur to you before? Uh, I mean, and, and you could tie it even specifically to when you joined Schlotzky's. Yeah, so it's something we've noticed just looking at, at brand in general. So we, we do a lot of testing. You know, we, we use great, um, uh, great media partners, Nielsen's, those, those of the world. Uh, but looking at our marks, rights, everything else, all the logos that we have, what's impactful, colors, fonts, so the Viz ID, you know, we had, we had been Austin Eatery for a few years. Um, that was a different, really a different concept than this idea brand. You know, we've moved back to what the core of Schlotzky's is um, and trying to trying to really find that essence in those, those, those core colors. But we've noticed really throughout is that there's a lot of simplification going on uh, with this idea with brand. So Burger King is a great example. It's funny, like the 1970s have kind of come back, right? <laughs> and so a lot more rounded, a lot more simple. If you look at uh, good exercise is just look on your phone at your apps and just see those icons, how those have changed. They're a lot less, you know, the, the HBO Max one's a great one. It's a lot more rounded. It's interesting just to see from a Viz ID standpoint in general that these sharp edges, a lot of detail is going away. It's getting more simple. Um, and so we're trying to incorporate a lot of that into our brand as well. But the other thing I would say at Schlotzky's is the food is the hero, right? So anything within our Viz ID, the food needs to stand out. A giant original is that is the core of our brand. So when somebody comes in, they get that on a plate or in a bag. That's what they're looking forward to, and that's what they're going to focus on. Not not copy, not messaging. How do you make the product stand out? That's great. Now, as a um, as as a Californian that hasn't uh, traveled in a long time, I've got to ask. You mentioned you're going to open up a bunch of stores here in the next couple of years. Any world where one's coming to uh, one's coming to California? I I think so i don't want to give away too much right, <laughs> right. But, but yeah i mean i i think you'd be pleasantly surprised at what our footprint will look like right um but hey the other i would i wouldn't be a good focus marketer if i didn't talk about the other other brands come to all seven of us i mean a carvel cake is something that if you're not from the northeast or not familiar with it uh it is heaven um but obviously we other brands as well so if you can't get to a Schlotsky's, there's McAllister's, mo's there's everybody Yep, we got a Jamba right down the street from our house. It's awesome. Perfect. <laughs> we hit that a lot. Um, I think that that's all the time that we have, Casey. I really appreciate the, uh, the the time and you taking a couple of minutes to chat with us here this morning. Thank you so much. No, thank you. This was awesome. Great. Ryan, back to you. Uh-oh. We've lost Ryan. We can go freestyle here for a little bit, right? <laughs> no riff. There we go. What, 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 you know, so when you think about, let's go back to the, the digital transformation piece a little bit. And, and, you know, when you think about that, like, how do you go justify the budget for something like that? You go, okay, I want to do X project. Like, what's the conversation like to have to say, okay, we want to do X project. Here's what it's going to do for us. And it kind of goes back to that question that I had about, is it a competitive advantage or is it a business efficiency? 
Yeah, I think everybody understands that that digital transformation is something and getting first party data. I think it gets easy, right? When somebody at Google says, no more third party cookies. Here. Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I need to build as much as my as much as I can. But it all comes down to ROI and cost benefit. So we try to build things out of, okay, how many more guests do I need to drive? How much, how much more of the business profitability or the, you know, the EBITDA side do I need to drive? So these decisions kind of like build themselves in a way, you know, the 3G capital way is doing zero-based budgeting. So justify this with, but you need to give me break-evens. You need to give me a lot of finance work. And I think on the, as the marketer, you got to live in numbers and data anyway, but being able to justify, hey, I'm going to connect with these amount of guests and drive this, this much more traffic and sales if I can build this capability for X amount of dollars. That's just part of the job now. Yeah. Well, and we talked about having like a team of developers who can help you with some of those in-house things that you want to build. Do you also have a, an in-house finance person on your team that can help you with those justifications as well? Yeah. Yeah, we sure do. He's great. awesome. He's a great guy. That's good. And so that's always one of the filters of, hey, what do you think about this? Help us. And so we never do anything from a place without data or justification. So it's not what I want. It's not what Tori, our brand president, wants. What does the research say? What does the data say? What is finance operations? And then we make a decision. And let's rock and roll on it. Cool. Ryan, I see you've joined us again. I think we're right at the 11 o'clock hour or 11 o'clock here on the West Coast. Yes, gentlemen. Um, somehow, some way, we have made it to the end of our session. It's crazy how fast <laughs> it goes, right? Casey, this was great. I really appreciate the, uh, the time. And Ryan, thank you so much for, for hosting us and to Brand Innovators for being great hosts. Thank Absolutely. you, guys. Appreciate the time. Um, Scott, thank, you. thank you so much for taking care of our moderating for this session. You did a great job. Um, and Casey, you. it's always insightful to hear your perspective. And gentlemen, I hope to see you back uh, on our virtual stage soon. And if we're lucky in person at some point uh, over the next few weeks and coming months. Fingers but, crossed, South by Southwest next year. We're, we're aiming on it. We're, awesome. we're going to be there. We're going to be in ad week. Uh, we'll be out for advertising week as well. I'm out in New York City. So um, if you're in the area, definitely let me know. We have a lot cooking and would love to have, um, you know, we're going to be putting on a crazy, crazy, amazing event, um, four day event, which we'll share at the end of this live cast. But uh, if anybody's interested, please feel free to use that chat window and I can personally send you some information. Wonderful. Ryan, well, if Casey, you're going to thank South you both. If you're going, sorry, if you're going to South by, you have to get a Slavsky's plug because that's some other ship. That was the first one in South Congress. So come see us. There you go. Cool. cool. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Guys. Awesome. So uh, we are going to be moving on to our next stage. Um, and unfortunately, we didn't plan ahead to give this person a major motion picture introduction, complete with music, background, visuals, and all that. Uh, but regardless, we are happy to introduce uh, James Stewart Cullen, the Senior Marketing Director with Brands and Original Strategy at Paramount Plus and a division of Viacom CBS. Did everyone follow that? I said a lot there. I hope everyone picked up what I was putting down. We have an amazing moderator. That's Deidre Lester, CRO at Barstool Sports. Want to welcome our two next speakers right now. Um, looks, like we, looks like we're here. How's everybody doing today? Doing good.